hello everyone. I um, hope you all can hear me, but welcome to the Hanover Adventure Tours Adventure Talk series. Uh, very happy to have you all join us tonight. Um, we are, have a local artist named Matt Brown joining us tonight, and I'll be introducing him shortly. First off, I first want to introduce myself. My name is Jane Trailer. I am representing Hanover Adventure Tours tonight. And welcome to the Adventure Talk series. First off, love to tell you guys a little bit about Hanover Adventure Tours. Uh, so we are a newly developed Adventure Center um, tour company located right on the Connecticut River. And we really work towards being the adventure hub for the Upper Valley. Uh, we have many different options to you know, explore the Upper Valley and have a good time. Um, and you might have saw a couple of screens uh, before the event started, just kind of explaining a few things we do. Um, and I thought I'd explain that as well. So at Hanover Adventure Tours has many different options from electric bikes. We have over nine different models here and you can take out an electric bike for a rental or even purchase an electric bike here. And one thing that we really focus on here at Hanover Adventure Tours is the experiences. So whenever you take out an e-bike, you have over 70 different pre-planned routes to explore the area. And um, we really love to take you down those roads less traveled um, and get to know local farms and local businesses. And one of them is Matt Brown Fine Arts, um, who is our speaker here tonight. He has a gallery located in Lyme, New Hampshire, and that is one of our partners, and that's why we've featured him here tonight. A few other things that we do here at Hanover Adventure Tours is tours, which is in our name. We do electric bike tours as well as private coach tours. You can explore the Woodstock farmlands or learn some historical facts on Dartmouth College or even a brewery distillery tour. A few other things is we are right on the Connecticut River and have a convenient um, location that you can jump on in the water right here. We have paddle boards, canoes, kayaks, um, kind of everything you can do here, even tubing. So lots of options here. We just really want to introduce ourselves and let you know that we're here, we're part of the community, and uh, we're looking to be that hub. Uh, one other thing we do have here also is um, a hostel. We mostly house Appalachian Trail hikers, and we have a bunk room as well as some private rooms uh, right alongside the Adventure Center. So that's a little bit about us. Um, and so one thing we've started to do for the winter season is have Adventure Talk series. Uh, and that's what we're doing tonight. We have usually these series every Thursday at 6 p.m. And some of them will be about the Colorado Trail or the Appalachian Trail or some of our partners like Matt Brown. So tonight we have Matt Brown joining us and um, he has been a member of the New Hampshire's Craftsman League for over 25 years. He actually has some of our art here in our building here, um, which is beautiful to see and pretty fun. So other than that, I am going to introduce Matt, but first off, I want to let you know what this discussion is really going to be about. We look at this as a discussion, so we love to open it up to everyone here that's joining us. I am going to give you all access to opening up your um, videos if you'd like. You can turn on your sound after Matt um, kind of says, hey guys, let's, let's discuss, um, and you're more than welcome to do that. You don't have to put your video on if you don't want to, but you do have that option. Um, so other than that, I am going to pass this along to Matt and um, let's, you know, have a, have a good time tonight. I'm very excited for this discussion here. So let's get it started. Let's just make sure it's all set. And now I've all given you access to turn on your videos if you want. Um, and Matt, I see you have joined us. All right. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. So can you hear me? I can. Yeah. How about, uh, how about our other folks signing on here? It would be great to see faces. 
if you guys can sign on uh, with your video, turn your video on. That's um, great. <laughs> yeah, let's see, because we have how many we have? Well, we have 13 people or something. My, I've got two devices going in case that, in case that becomes handy. Okay, great. So, cool. There's a few folks I recognize. There's Jay. Hello, Jay. And Kate. And uh, cool. So one question is whether we actually um, should, should could, or could go along and just say hello. Like just you might say your first name and, and where you are. That'll help me. It'll help me picture who I'm talking to here. Um, like, uh, let's see, who is turned off on their sound is, uh, well, Kate. Oh, no, Hi. Not. Yeah, Kate's in Thetford. And yep. on my screen next to you is, uh, I don't recognize. Let's see, Beth, uh, a fellow named Odie. Where are uh, you, Odie? How's everything going? Good. Where are you? I am in New York City. Oh, wow. How'd you get be. onto this? I don't want to be. I'm a country boy. I don't mean to be here. <laughs> How'd you get onto this event? I'm selling Christmas trees. <laughs> oh, you're down in New York selling Christmas trees. Yeah. But you're really from nice. the Upper Valley. Uh-huh. Oh, no, cool. uh, Living in a luxury apartment for the month. Oh, cool. Yeah, Odie's a, yeah. a good friend of ours, so he decided to oh, nice. join as well. Yeah. And, I like uh, art. Nice. Jay, you want to share where you're, where you are right now? Oh, I'm in uh, Brunswick, Maine. Cool. <laughs> and uh, Janine Penfield, where are you? I'm in Concord, Massachusetts, and I actually have two of your prints. You came to my house one time to see them. Oh. I had it installed with a mirror. In oh, you're room. in like an arts and crafts house. Yes. Oh, I remember you. Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, and and let's, next to you, Marcy, how do you pronounce Manitove? Uh, just Manitove. 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 I'm in yeah. Hartford, Vermont. Oh, neat. And, um, I worked for a while at the League of New Hampshire Craftsmen at the Hanover store oh, and wow. sold some of your stuff there. How did you hear about this event? Um, I think on Daybreak. Oh. The, uh, daily email that uh rob gerwitt i think his name is does yeah and beth cruzy where where are you hi um i'm in this little box right here <laughs> yeah. i live in norwich vermont i have a couple of your prints um like and, um had you heard about this hanover adventure tours i've heard of Kind of adventure tours, um, definitely an adventurer and traveler and um, love doing all sorts of stuff. Want to hook up with these guys at some point. And um, yeah. And uh, Cynthia, where, where are Hi. you? Hi, I'm in Lebanon. Yeah? Yeah. And how did you hear about this event? I think it was daybreak. Oh, wow. And Eric, we already spoke with Eric. He's down in, are you in Manhattan or in Brooklyn, Eric? Oh, no, that was Odie. Oh, that was Odie. Oh, we haven't heard I'm, from Eric. Yeah, where, where are I'm you? I'm from uh, Heartland, Heartland, Vermont. Oh, cool. Yeah? Yep. And I love art, so this is exciting. And then somebody who's also at the, um, at the Hanover Adventure Tours, uh, you're, uh, on my screen, you're the, you're the next person over. Uh, you're you're signed on as Adventure hey. Talks too. Who yeah, are you? Hi, my name's Catherine. I'm in Peachum, Vermont. Uh, um, I'm just interested in printmaking. Oh, cool. So I got in daybreak this morning. Oh, I see. And Evan, what's going on? Yeah, where are you? I'm at Hanover Adventure Tours. I also work here, so. Oh, I see. <laughs> cool, cool. And George Ledyard, where are you? Well, I'm out in Seattle, actually. I, I found this. One of my printmaking friends posted it on uh, Facebook. Awesome. Oh, cool. Oh, cool. And uh, 
Oh, Kate has her, uh, she's muted. Uh, she's got herself muted. Oh. oh, here she comes. Yeah. Hi, Kate. Uh, oh. Whoops. Here, let me, I can't, I'm trying to start the video. It won't go. Okay. Only well, the, you oh, have wait. a lovely smile there. Here we go. Oh, okay. there you go. Yeah, I know the, the still photo, I'm, I'm making dinner, so I have myself on the stop frame, but okay. I'm in Thetford and uh, yeah, I, I took a, I, I like, I like woodblock prints and I like printmaking and I'm, I'm always interested in hearing what Matt has to say. Cool. And I'm in Thetford making dinner. <laughs> yeah. so I'll, I'll listen, but I'll put, probably put my still frame back up if you don't care. Did you make dinner um, for all of us? <laughs> <laughs> uh, actually, I probably, but I got something at the co-op today. I probably would feed everybody. Oh, leave <laughs> it on out. <laughs> So I see a couple other folks, um, uh, a Jeffrey, a Kim, and an Audrey, but they haven't got their uh, video or their sound on, so we won't put them on the spot. Maybe we'll get started. A lot of times when I'm talking to, uh, in public on one subject or another, I actually like to start with questions, but uh, we don't have to do that. But if anybody's got, you know, we do have a title, and um, if anything, if anybody wants to jump in, uh, it actually helps me to know, you know, a little bit how to pitch things uh, as we go along. Uh, don't feel like you have to, but does somebody feel moved to just jump in with a question? How, how long have you been uh, doing oh, printmaking? Yeah. So uh, I started in uh, 1993. And um, what, I, what I did was I got up this morning and uh, a little early and, and, and uh, tweaked a PowerPoint presentation that I've used before to talk about sort of the span of my work or my story. And, um, and, and I'm thinking of sharing that, um, you know, doing a screen share and sharing that. And, it, and, and the pitch is to the topic, which part art, which part craft. And um, maybe there's, there's some here, a few of you who've signed on have mentioned, you know, an interest in prints or printmaking. And uh, printmaking does bring up sort of matters of art and craft, um, perhaps a little more than other activities or it, it you know, it, 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 there's a lot of craft to printmaking. So it may be conducive to this concept. I might just jump in and say, that, okay, so I started making these prints in 1993. Oh, welcome, uh, Audrey. Hello, Audrey. Um, and, um, uh, but um, as time went on, oh, I remember about the year 2000, maybe a little, maybe 2005, um, down in um, uh, Henniker, New Hampshire, New England College, they had a little talk series, and it, it literally was, it could have had this title, but it basically was the dynamics of art and craft, and they invited several people to come talk to the, to, to this, uh, you know, it was a, sort of like this, but we were not, it was not virtual, and um, that really got me thinking about, well, wait a minute, how would I define differences between art and craft? And I found it really handy to have come up with some kind of a, a, a definition or a yardstick or a way of thinking of it at that time. And partly, uh, there's, there's a couple of um, uh, uh, dynamics that can come up. Uh, a lot of times people, you, you, you think of art and craft and you kind of think, well, which one's better <laughs> or which one's more you know, which one's uh, harder or which one's more spiritual or which one, you know, is there more chance for expression with craft or with art? And, and uh, it, we, we have the dynamic in the league, in my membership of the league, because um, we don't really um, jury in art. We, we exclude art. It's a crafts organization, but printmaking is mm -hmm. uh, a part of the League of New Hampshire Craftsmen uh, because printmaking, there, you, you can kind of, get your hand around some uh, significant craft aspects and in our definitions about what qualifies and doesn't and so forth, uh, issues of craft um, are, are, are at hand. And that also helped in, um, in forming my uh, thinking. Uh, how are we doing so far? Have I piqued your interest? Sure. Okay, cool. So the, 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 the definition or the, the, the way I sort it out is really not that complicated. It's, it's that um, 
the the art part uh, or back up uh, a moment my idea is that there's art and craft in everything we do um, uh, just me talking to you involves some art and some craft the craft part of me talking to you, a lot of it is dependent on the words that I've learned and used before. I'm not going to use any words that are new, that are unique, that I've never used before. And I'm going to talk to you in a way that's learned with sentence structure and grammar that you can understand and so on. But there's an art element to me talking to you this evening. And that's uh, the, the part that's unique. So in my, in my definition here, in my way of thinking of this, I think of the art part as the part that is unique. In a way, everything is unique in each moment. But in, at the same time, in a way, everything is learned and has been done before in each moment. So for me, I think of the two as in, in some ways inseparable. There's got to be art and craft in everything we do, but the two things are different and it's helpful to talk about them and talk about the differences because there are things that we can learn and we, and we repeat and we, can, we, we have expected results and so on. And then there are other things that are innovative and fresh and unique in each moment. And that's that, it's this sort of partnership between the art and the craft. Mm. How does that all sound? <laughs> does that prompt any well, questions? Yeah. Hey. I mean, I, I think I think the more art that I try to do, the more I realize how much craft is involved. I, and I, I, I think it's a I think it's a good thing. Uh, it, it's just interesting. And it's so interesting to hear you sort of oh, I've heard you say it before too, but I love it. You know, everything has been done before. That's also kind of a, just not related to the topic, but it's something that's related to art and art making and also craft. And yeah, anyway, I just, it's validating everything I've discovered. I mean, it's a quality to all of life. In some ways, everything has been done before. Nothing is entirely new on the, uh, you know, under the sun. And yet everything is also a unique moment, you know? Each day is, is, in its own way, unique. Each moment is unique. As we go along in this Zoom uh, webinar, you know, it really is unique. We don't know what's going to happen. <laughs> we don't know who's going to talk next. We don't know, you know. Uh, so, uh, yeah. Other, other thoughts or comments at, 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 in this moment? We're, we're about a third of the way through our time. Uh, so I'm guessing my little PowerPoint is probably maybe 10, 15 minutes or so. So it might be nice. We might chat for another, I could see another three to five minutes, start the PowerPoint, and then we'll have 15, 20 minutes afterwards. We could talk some more. Do you feel like you need both, but would one come before the other? Like, do you need to have that craft? before you have that unique style of your own? Yeah, because that, that, that often comes up. Um, you know, well, you know, do you need to get the craft down before you really can get to the art? Yeah. Uh, uh, is, is one, you know, one thought that often arises. I don't, I think the two are working together all the time. Um, I'm really interested in equality um, uh, of, 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 you know, most activities, not only art activities, that I think of as beginner mind, um, where oftentimes, I, you know, I, I teach this, uh, you know, I make these color woodblock prints and I teach it. And uh, sometimes there's this um, fresh quality to the way people go after projects that I realized if they, ha they, they express frustration that they don't have a better handle on the craft often. Mm -hmm. And that's a little bit relevant to your to your question. Mm -hmm. But from my point of view, I, I, I see the sort of beauty of, of the fact that, that, that they don't have that craft down because the art is more palpable. It's all new and they're having to figure it out. And so they aren't doing things, you know, because that's the way it worked the last time quite mm -hmm. as much. Casso mm -hmm. uh, uh, said to learn the rules like a lawyer so that you could break them like an artist. Uh, <laughs> That's nice. Yeah. 
Actually, let's say that again. Let's see. To learn the rules like... Picasso said, learn the rules like an artist so that you can break them like... No, learn no, the yeah. rules like a lawyer, lawyer so that you can break them like an artist. Yeah. So learn the craft and then break it all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, mm -mm. I mean, I have another really favorite... Um, uh, I don't know if it's a yardstick or it's, it's a saying. Um, it came from my main professor in college. Um, really brilliant woman. Yes, that's right. Limits are form. So her point is that um, without limits and, and limits are, you know, when you're, when you're breaking the rules, you're breaking through limits. And her point is actually we need rules and limits and maybe what Picasso is kind of referring to is you want to learn the rules of the language like a lawyer might in order to be innovative like an artist might. As somebody who makes their living making art I can tell you that there's a lot less innovation and magic art moments than you might think <laughs> in, in many ways. You know to make it really work it really the craft is, is really important to be able to do things um, re repeti re repeatedly. And, and that, that idea of limits our form has helped me a great deal in um, being happy with those limits. And, and um, you know, because my, to, to make these, I make these prints and it, you know, it's repetitive work. You know, I, I, I work with images over the course of many years, same image. And part of the, the, the slide, preservation presentation in a few minutes is to sort of show you how that stays that there's still art in it even if i printed a print you know 100 200 300 times there's still mm -hmm. art in the balance of color and i you know so on. i was just printing a print just now that i've printed i don't know 150 or something and every, and I, i'm laying in one of the last colors and i it, it totally felt like art you know, uh, oh, a little too much purple. Ooh, and I pulled that impression. Ooh, uh, 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 not enough purple. <laughs> and maybe if I have it fade just a little more like that. And then the next one, ooh, back off a little. Oh. It felt like there was art to it, but there's also a craft. In other words, I was doing something repeated and I had my brushes set up and so on. Is your inspiration always there though? I feel as if you say that you've done these these prints so many times can it can it get tiring can you know i see you know your love of it just explaining it there but like is there one print that you're like i can't i can't go back to it or you know I, well if, if you know for me if a print has a problem if it's not really worked out that's when i like want to walk away from it <laughs> but if it's working and i'm intrigued it's like a conversation it's like you know playing a musical instrument or, you know, skiing, if you like to ski, it, 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 it's kind of endlessly nourishing and, and, and yeah, I don't, but I think one of the reasons I don't tire of it is because of this art craft dynamic. I'm happy, you know, doing the craft. I'm happy dealing with the art. And, and by say dealing with the art, you know, you know, there are all, there, there is always art in everything, you know, we have to make unique decisions. Um, and, and that's can be burdensome, um, you know, sort of the opposite of inspiration, but it can be overwhelming to, to, to always have to reinvent the wheel, for instance, in every moment. So it can be very um, um, uh, freeing to have a lot of craft, to have an activity that's repetitive and, you know, you, know, you don't have to figure it all out each yeah. time. Yeah, that makes sense. Does that kind of speak to it a little bit? That definitely does. Yeah. 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 Um, are, are folks up for trying the screen share uh, thing? I don't, the first question, um, Jane, is whether I'm able to do a screen share. Let's see. Uh, so you need to, you need to enable screen sharing somehow. For Here we me. go. I just did it. Let's try again. Oh yeah, that, there you go. Okay. okay. Well, it would have been good, of course, if I had this uh, queued up. I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk for just a few minutes while I get this out here. Um, 
Um, okay. Yeah, right here. what you're going to get start here all right so um do you all see this mm -hmm. you know this is a slideshow without sound um and uh uh there 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 it sets it out you know there's art and craft in everything we do the art is that which is unique the craft is the part which can be learned and repeated and here we have some images of uh folks making wood block prints. So um, I use this uh, method, it's a Japanese method. It goes back, uh, actually really got developed in Japan in the uh, latter part of the 18th century. Um, and uh, when um, wood block printing, which, which had gone, it may be as old as thousand years or something, uh, actually with a tool um, called a, uh, a baron. Uh, this is my printing tool, this baron. And that tool may be hundreds of years or maybe even a thousand years. They don't really know how old. That's to press um, papers to a carved woodblock to print uh, books and then imagery and so on. But in the 18th century, they uh, it was actually possibly one particular artist figured out how to make um, uh, multiple blocks uh, uh, and, and print multiple colors. Um, prints and it really took off as an art form. It's known as ukiyo-e, uh, really, the Japanese prints, and it is probably like the most productive uh, art form uh, of, of a society. They made millions of prints. It was a really big industry in Japan before, at a time when the country was, was sealed off, it was isolated from the rest of the world. Uh, we won't get into all that history, but it, it, it opened up in 1853 by American naval ships. And then things happen and the, the, the color woodblock that, that is that industry kind of changes and so on. Anyway, I got onto it right after uh, birth of a first boy in 1993. And these are early prints that I was figuring out back in that day. And they're a little resonant of those Japanese prints had a a, a single block black line uh, carved to um, uh, to sort of lead the print, and then color blocks would 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 be carved to match the black line. And this is me figuring out sort of my language back in the 1994, 95, and so on. By 95, I'd let go of the black line key blocks and had turned to mountain themes. So that's a little bit of the story of of what was going on and. And here I'm using, you know, I'm, I'm continuing to learn the craft, but there was some art insight about how I might be able to uh, develop my blocks uh, to tell the stories of, of my prints. Mm -hmm. And um, here's uh, getting into some ocean themes and I'm working off of drawings or watercolors. Um, and uh, I got into uh, different, I'm exploring different themes. Here's, here's uh, some copy prints. The one on the uh, on your left mm. is mm. a uh, copy of a Vermeer painting, mm. um, and uh, I learned a lot from that. I learned that um, there's a lot of magic to the, you know, th th that print had only six blocks. And I was like, wow, wow how, how can you get you know sense of light and space and even a little bit of atmosphere with six blocks? And, and that's kind of the magic of the, uh, of the art part and the whole Vermeer story is really interesting about how he, maybe he had done it, of course, with oil paint, with oil paint. Here's a print I made um, sort of right after that where I felt like, oh, wow, I'm, I'm starting to get a, a you know, I'm starting to capture some of the magic. Um, so here shows a little bit of the craft part. Is everybody along doing all right here? Are we doing okay? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, love to learn how yeah. this all works. I think that's right. something. So yeah. there's a basic trick. I mean, this is a craft element um, that um, enabled the uh, those Japanese artists. And actually, the way it was set up is the artists actually just did the drawings. And then 
there'd be a shop that carved the blocks and another shop that would print them. It was really quite an industry. There were, there were literally uh, hundreds of artists involved, you know, full time and thousands of printers and carvers. So it was, you know, it was, they, they don't, they don't really know the extent of it, but it was thousands of people working on this art form in, in, in Edo, you know, between like 1780 and, and 1870 or such, um, uh, Edo in 1800 was biggest city in the world. So they really, they really figured out some tricks here. And I just adopted and, and followed the, those tricks, not to be Japanese, but because it's quite a wonderful art form. Using simple, simple tools, I, I've got most of my tools just right here on my desk. Uh, uh, the, the, uh, I'll bring a few more out as we go along. So I'm pasting a, a, a drawing face down on a block and um, we'll use that to carve. So here I am, um, what you see on that block is actually, you're looking through the applied paper um, and the image on the paper is there pasted on the block and I follow along to carve the block or blocks. And that's here, here you can see it. That's how um, I can carve the blocks so they'll fit together because I can, I can take a carved block, print it, take that sheet of paper and paste it to a new block in order to be able to carve and you know, have shapes come alongside mm. when I go to print them. Mm. Does, that, does that make some sense? Mm. We're talking yeah. some, you know, from some craft elements. This is Matt, yeah. I, yeah. I have a quick question. Yeah. Um, what, what's your choice of wood uh, for carving into? Oh yeah, so there are four main woods that I carve. I carve um, uh, two softer woods, basswood and uh, poplar, and I carve birch and cherry. The, the, the Japanese prints were mostly made with a cherry, solid cherry wood. So this I think is cherry actually, this block. Mm. And, and here I am carving at my printing bench in, in my shop with, uh, with uh, gouges. So I'll often carve with a knife or a little, I'll, I'll show you my tools or, um, so uh, are, you, are you able to see, um, Maybe I should set up this other video. Are you able to see? Uh, what are you able to see? Are you able to see my face here? Yes. Oh, you are. So these are gouges that I use. And then I use this, um, this knife for carving. And you can see the same knife right on the, on the, on the workbench right, right there. I see it, yeah. yeah. So here, here we're moving to some um, steps of the printing. Um, and um, uh, so on the lower, well, on the upper right, I've got pigment in jars. I've got a little, a little, um, um, little cup of, of rice paste actually, and a bowl of water. Those are sort of past my left hand there. And then I've got brushes, same as these brushes here that I was just painting, but I haven't, I haven't cleaned them out yet. And I've got my Baron, the, the Baron that's right, that's right here. And so in the lower left, I'm, I'm using that brush to rub and apply the pigment to the, really to the pore of the wood. You're, you're trying to get the wood to sort of take up that pigment. And then uh, in the lower right, you see me applying uh, a paper to the block. There are these little carved clefts called Kento to hold the registration. And oh, here's here's uh, here's going on to my um, uh, the Baron, the, the the tool for for pressing the print. Lay that paper, press the print. The pressure of the print helps the pigment go from the pore of the wood to the pore of the paper. And uh, in this lower left, you see me now. Well, there in the upper right, you see me pressing with the Baron, and you kind of see the print kind of coming through the paper. In the lower left, you can see me pulling a print. And then on the lower right, you can see me actually, I'm printing there at the Sunapee Fair, the League's Sunapee Fair. And I've got a stack of papers on my left and that's my mm -hmm. little portable printing bench. Cool. Any technical questions about the uh, craft? I think we go back to, I, I'm gonna be showing you some drawings, a little bit of sort of prints in process and some things like that. Are we doing I'm, all right? Yeah, I'm curious um, and you kind of already explained it, but just 
the carving comes in and then you've put like some type of pigment on it and the brush itself is what captures that color. I'm, I'm curious on the color aspect of it. I just, I think I... So, so basically it's, it's, you could think of it as painting with blocks and it's technically watercolor printing. Okay. It, it really is, is, is the, it, it's really a water media. It works like watercolor. Watercolor, you, you, you lay on that color and it, and it, and it goes into the paper. And um, it, which is different from uh, acrylic painting or oil painting or something, you can, you can actually paint with just pigment and water. It'll, it'll go to that paper, and 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 that's how that's technically what this printing is like. The pressure of the Baron really sets that pigment in the paper. The brushes are just for getting the blocks evenly. You want that color even. You know, uh, you, you, you not too much, but just enough. You you, you want the the block well primed and full of, of pigment. That's, that's, that's where the brushes come in. Okay. Does that yeah. make sense? Yeah, it does, it does. Thank you. Any other uh, technical craft questions before we move on to maybe a little more of the art part? Oh, oh yeah? Is that Eric or, yeah? No, it's, uh, it's me. Oh, Jay, uh, yeah. yeah. What kind of paper were you using it? So I'm using a, um, actually a French made cotton paper. I don't print on Japanese papers. Um, that's, uh, that's, uh, that was a sort of an art decision <laughs> that got made. Um, so we could talk, you know, I could see talking more about that maybe at, at the end if, if people are right. particularly interested. Good. Um, so Matt, here's, you know, Sorry, real quick. Uh, I don't know if this would be a technical question, but um, I was just curious. You, you mentioned several different types of wood you like to carve into. Yeah. Depending on what type of scene, whether it's indoors or outdoors, does that determine what kind of wood oh, yeah. you're carving into yeah. and how yeah. much uh, like um, paint you apply to the wood to produce the print? Yeah, like why why basswood in one print or cherry in another? Right, or, right. So, um, uh, in general, my own feeling for it is the softer woods, you kind of get the shapes. They 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 have a different quality. They I, I tend to get more uh, shapes with more fluidity, I guess I would say. And the harder woods, I often will select harder woods when I really want to. Uh, there's more detail or I want those shapes to be a little more like, mm, yeah. <laughs> it doesn't describe it very well, but, um, and I, you know, sometimes I think, oh, you know, I should just only work on birch blocks. That's, that's what really works. But then, you know, of course I change or my idea changes or I'm out to, yeah, it, it can, it can, it can depend on my image idea. Um, uh, like these prints here, well, I know the one in the upper left, are, are all basswood blocks. Hmm. Um, and then I think the other two, maybe they're harder blocks. And I, uh, so, um, yeah, I mean, there's little little carving shapes. and what, What's interesting, one of the things that's really interesting about this medium for me is you're basically, you know, you're printing with flat colors or flat carved blocks, right? And you can affect the color with the with the way you brush to the block. So, for instance, the one on the top is something of a fade. It's darker color at the top of that sky, and you fade it to the lighter near the horizon, and that's achieved by the way you brush the color to the block. And that gives a, an impression of of well, light and some volume or dimension. At any rate, so I'm playing with with you know the sort of reception of form and whatnot, but I, I'm really interested in the juxtaposition of the soft watercolor and the carved um, graphic shapes. But one of the things about those carved shapes is they're actually, even though they're kind of crude because they're just wood, they're quite communicative because it's, it's sort of like the limits our form idea here, which is if you just have simple shapes, the way our, our minds work, you know, the way we perceive things, we pick up on little details of contour and, and the sort of gesture of line and so forth to interpret what we're seeing. 
our minds are just doing it all the time. And so those simple contoured carved shapes can really communicate a lot. And I love the conversation of you, you put something down on a paper, you carve it, and then you print it, and then it, it's not what you thought. It, you know, it's, it's different. It has its own life. But then you, you tweak it a little to make it what it wants to be. It's more or less how I go at these prints. So here's some other images where, you know, some of this has going, been going on and I've invented things and just, just, just dealt with it. Like that, that snow scene on the, on the right there, that's just one block, I believe, describing that foreground, that snow in the foreground and all. And what's gone on there is I just kind of took the way I carved it and I tweaked it a little here and I tweaked it a little there until it really just described this, you know, sort of this bank by this stream that I visualize in my mind. It's near where I live and, and, and you know, so. <laughs> it's the art conversation. Um, uh, and here, here's more of it. There's craft too, though. You know, if you don't, Print that with just the right. If it's if the color is too dark or too heavy or or too light, it, it it's not as good. <laughs> so. Matt, are these mostly reduction prints? So they're not. None of them are reduction prints. They're oh, they so are, you're using multi-block for all. These of them. are multi-blocks. So this is pretty traditional. It's it's a stack of blocks. It's you know it's like the great wave that Hokusai made or whatever. It's a stack of blocks, and uh, uh, yeah, and and there's a lot of rehearsal. Uh, to getting these worked out, these are older. We should move along because uh, I, I, you know, more, more, you know, more of the newer prints are coming. So here is one interesting little exception, sort of related to the art craft dynamic that I'm still thinking a lot about, which is here these two prints. I have one block which is a a drawn line. So uh, you know, drawing is a fascinating activity. You know, I'm interested in the word, you know, to draw. Like if, if you, you use line to, to, to describe what's, you know, really not line. It's our world is made of shapes with edges and contours. But at any rate, that line, uh, you take a drawn line and get a, I've, I've gotten um, metal, metal plates made. And then the color blocks are made to work with those metal plates. That's what these two prints are. Mm. This shows a print just evolving where I, on the left, I did this print, but I thought, well, that's not that interesting. And then I was down by the Connecticut River, just across the river from where, well, wait a minute. No, just a little bit upriver from where Jane is yeah. on the Vermont side. Looking, looking across the river, you get a view of Smarts Mountain. Yes, and, um, uh, but one morning <laughs> I was on the New Hampshire side and there was a, you know, a red-winged blackbird down there by the river. I don't know if it was early spring. I, I assume it was. I thought, I had to put a red-winged blackbird in that print. That set off, you know, hundreds of hours of work <laughs> with carving and so on. Because uh, it, 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 for a while, it was sort of heavy, like this middle, middle one that was like third state version of this print. And I, I, it took me a long time. But... Um, there on the on the right is is the way I like it the most, and I, I just finished another batch of that print, which is you know these are dated uh, oh more than ten years ago, so I've been working on that for a long time. Wow. This shows um, uh, uh, often how a, a drawing now there's there's stuff behind the drawing there feeding into that drawing would be other drawings. There was I remember doing a drawing on site, taking photographs, then using those photographs and that drawing to create this drawing, which then was used to create the, the, the first blocks to make the print that you see below. And there's a little art and craft in that whole business going on down, I would say. Uh, here's another print related to it. I just showed it. Here's some winter prints. I, I didn't have time this morning to get the drawings. It would have been neat. The, the one on the right, I remember I had a pretty, pretty developed watercolor painting that I used. As, as was the case on this, I remember this Tuckerman's from Wildcat Mountain. I had a nice oil, little oil painting that I worked that print from. Whereas the one on the left, I have this muddy, messy, bad watercolor on a board. It, it just looks like nothing. And, but that's the print that it led to. 
And this shows how uh, work on the prints might evolve. So years ago, I was doing this along Franconia Ridge with these sort of green colors. And I made some changes. It's, it's subtle, but there's a whole block that prints the foreground. And, um, uh, you know, I, I, I sometimes work these prints quite a lot. You know, I change them. So you work on prints for years. Oh, yeah, yeah. Paint. And it's yeah. That, 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 that thing, it's, it's distinctly opposite to reduction, where mm -hmm. I'm printing the blocks over, over, over and over again a lot. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And, and often I'll see prints, you know, both of these prints, when I, when I see the early versions, I kind of cringe. <laughs> you know, like, Ugh. And all it is, it's not really the, the, the it's not the blocks, it's the car, it's the printing, where there are just subtleties in the in the in the in the craft of the printing, but you know, figuring that out, there was art to it. Like, oh, you know, you should you should you should back off on that gray, print it way lighter, and and it makes a big difference. That's kind of how these prints have evolved. I feel like that goes towards a different a topic, but the energy theory of color and how I feel like color truly, like I just feel like these two pictures right here, they can give me probably a different feeling just from how this is you know, on the left-hand side, um, it's very yellow and bright. And the other one is more of a calming yeah. effect, I feel. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, we've had some really neat Zoom discussions on, uh, Jay's participated in a number of them to do with the, energy theory of color with this fellow, this uh, Professor Ming Meng. Um, what might be relevant to mention here is just that, um, uh, well, we're trying to read and organize our world. That's what our visual um, sensory experience is. Um, it's one of the main things that our brains do all day long. Um, it, it just makes sense of the world we're in. It's part of our survival. And to make art, to make, or, you know, to make or prints or, or images is to play with that, with that um, quality. Um, and, uh, you know, it's just, it's just fun to play with the balances of the colors and the, and the shapes. And, and a big part is how you lead your eye through the picture space, in my mind, mm. you know, how we travel through these, um, you know, sort of depicted uh, illusions, you know, mountainscapes, uh, you know, it's just, uh, it's just, they're just shapes and colors. You know? <laughs> <laughs> from carved blocks, you know, yeah. with, 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 with all that craft. Um, here's uh, showing this sort of evolution of a print um, where um, I ran it as this rain over Squam Lake. And the main change is just a, a, a color change, but I did, uh, we do have, one or two different blocks involved than the one on the right. Um, yeah. This this also shows how I sometimes tweak and mess with prints. Um, you know, in the one on the right, I got these little little lights on the far horizon, and and, and I change the moon, and there's a there's a block that prints a big dark across the sky. It, it, yeah. Uh, this shows a exhibit of a number of years ago, um, which kind of I'm sort of playing with the art, art and craft dynamic in that there are quite a few watercolors. Uh, well, those two middle rows are all watercolors. And on the top is a print. Oh, it's the print that you used. Um, I did. Uh, on a Facebook post. And yeah. this is it before it got figured out. It was still, um, you know, in the proofing stages. And uh, these are, that's what it, I was messing with. Yeah, there are a lot of hours go into these things. It's, 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 oh. it's really a lot of time. Here's uh, me pursuing the art and the craft of, uh, of finding homes for my work, of selling my work. Um, so um, uh, this year I didn't do any uh, shows out, but on a normal year, I, uh, let's see, two of these photographs are at the League's uh, Sunapee Fair. Uh, the one on the lower left is down in uh, Greenwich, Connecticut at the Bruce Museum. And the one on the right is down in um, Asheville, North Carolina, actually. Uh, uh, Arts and Crafts Conference there. And then, let's see. Oh, here's uh, uh, lots of print. Let's see. 
Uh, this just tells a story a little bit of that I've just been describing how the colors get brushed on the blocks and it's you're, it's kind of like you're painting painting with blocks. Oh, here here you see a watercolor sketch leading to a print. Oh wow. Um, so one of the things that's interesting about the method is, you know, you if you're printing an oil painting, you know, you might say, well, I got to move the mountain a little bit, make the mountain bigger. <laughs> but with a wood block, you, you don't want to do that. <laughs> you, have to, you cut all the blocks. But what you can do is you can change the colors, and just like that, change the colors significantly. And so uh, I find that interesting. Here's a, another watercolor, and that's this is the print that it got made to. Um, here's two pictures that I, I just had there. The, the top one is a fellow, it, it, it's down uh, um, in, in New York City, actually West, Upper West Side, a fellow who uh, he, he learned the craft in Japan back in the 60s, and he taught for many years at NYU. He's no longer alive, but uh, he became something of a mentor for me, Bill Payton. And below is uh, my friend uh, Carl Heckscher I met in 2001, also in New York. And here he is working on a, a Chuck Close print. And um, there's a kind of an intense amount of conversation around the art and craft part. Uh, that artist, um, some of you may have heard of, and that guy, he's into squeezing every last drop out of the... Of, you know, juice out of the stone or whatever, as Carl has learned to his chagrin. Here, here is um, uh, some, uh, and this is to finish the, the little slide presentation. These are um, images from uh, um, my woodblock classes, showing people making prints using the method. I, I have these little jigs and I bring these kits and, uh, you know, you can see uh, people making prints and these are, um, uh, prints that were made in the classes. Um, I'm really pleased and proud by, uh, with what sometimes comes out of a, out of a it's a three-day course I tend to teach. And we did one, the last one we did in June, we're hoping to do one in January, actually. I haven't listed it, I've just been too busy, but I think towards the end of January, we'll do one, uh, I, uh, we did this one in June, Zoom, we had, uh, with one student live, and then we had, I think, eight students, um, you know, virtual. So we did, and, and it worked, it worked quite well, actually. I sent out kits and uh, it, it really worked quite well. Mm. Uh, so these are actually, both of these prints were made by, by women who went on and, and actually are still making woodblock prints uh, uh, pretty seriously after taking the class. Wow. Uh, and these are some of my favorites. And I think we're, I think this is my last uh, uh, shot here. Uh, that that one on the left is out in uh, Denver, Colorado. That fellow Leon in the in the photo is uh, he's much more uh, known and accomplished. He's a reduction printmaker out in Denver, Colorado, and uh, he was he was a good good student. All right, I'm going to do the stop the screen share, and we'll take a look at. Let's see how do I. I'm having trouble getting the. There we go. Yeah. Okay. Um, so do we have anybody left here? <laughs> oh, good. We still have an audience. What time is it? Ah, well, we're close to to, uh, to the end of our hour. Um, but maybe there's some specific questions or comments or things people would like to share. Well, it was be beautiful work. I think um, I noticed like earlier in your um, career or art, you know, um, you did more family and, and more of like, um, not of landscapes. Do you feel like you've gone away from that or you mostly focus on landscapes or do you still, um, like to court, go towards something differently as yeah, well? Yeah, I mean, what, you know, one of the things I learned and, uh, um, making is, is neat. I mean, you're, you're, you're essentially making this matrix to make something scalable, you make it in multiple. So it innately brings in, you know, sort of, well, I don't know, call it commercial or you make things in multiple. So you, you sell them. So you interact with people around them. And I'll tell you that I just learned that, that, you know, folks are not so interested in imagery of people these days. I'll just say, 
culturally, we are interested in, I think we're interested in the sort of physical, natural world we live in. Mm -hmm. And we're, we're, we're not, you know, I, 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 you know, that's not entirely true. And, and, you know, there's still a place for imagery with, you know, with my family or whatnot. I, there's different veins. I've, I made these, a lot of very intimate little black and white prints of the family, which are really neat. Mm -hmm. um, but um, it's a little akin to what, you know, the Hanover Adventure Tours are, are, are about, which I've noticed that my prints more mm -hmm. or less function as, I guess, little portals for people to uh, the natural world. You yeah. know, they, 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 the, the ones that have been most, you know, resonant for people are ones that, that, that involve, especially those mountain ones and mm -hmm. where you're up in the mountains. And, and I, I, I mean, I was up on Lambert Ridge with my son and his girlfriend this morning. It was a beautiful morning. We got to this spot up there and I realized, oh, you know, I mean, it's such a wonderful connection to be in a space like that. And I got to tell you, Jane, that, you know, though that is, that evoking that feeling is, um, you know, that's enough. <laughs> I'll just, I'll just try to do that. Um, you know, it's hard enough as it is. That answers the question. Yeah, it does. And I think it's, it's easier also to just relate. I feel like I could be there. Um, so I could see the difference in that. Yeah. That that that's kind of what I'm after. I I I, I like to be transported by by uh, art. Um, you know, I like to feel like I can go there. And and the there is is a curious place because of course it's just shapes and colors on paper. Mm -hmm. But it's it it you know, and it's built of a lot of a lot of things. But one of the things I think it's built of it's built of this partnership of art and craft. Um, I find that the craft really um, enables a lot of the art, yeah. you know, um, uh, you know, that said, uh, you know, the, the craft is kind of meaningless without the art. So the two are, the two, you know, you need both of them. How would you say the craft um, of the wood, the wood making, how, how hard is that, the hanga method? Like, how long do you think the craft takes? Or it's like from these classes, the three-day classes like you'll you'll feel like oh. you have it in some in some way and now you're ready for your unique uh style to it or well you know a few of the images i showed you were people who i, I think one or two of them were people who were not particularly art oriented mm -hmm. and they did in three days they did really neat uh projects they're not big they're four by six uh prints but um you know and i had you know, I had cut all the paper and the blocks were all cut and things like that, um, which is a little bit what uh, Kate is referring to. Here's a note to end on. So my friend Carl, the, the guy doing the Chuck Close prints, we were in conversations a number of years ago and we say to ourselves, or Carl says to me, and I, 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 was, I said, I think you're right. He goes, you know, I think printmaking is about 90% housekeeping, maybe 6% craft and maybe four percent art <laughs> it's mostly housekeeping you know you gotta set it up you gotta get your colors you gotta you know you gotta clean your brushes you gotta yeah i mean you know maybe that's you know a, a little bit bleak but um but the 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 the, the, the you know the, the repeated and the I, I think the housekeeping is part of the craft that it, 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 it's an important part and in the classes you know people jump in and uh you can get it down it's sort of like cooking you just jump in and tar away and we've done a few things i've done some things where people have actually printed just in a one afternoon session like a lab session i've done that uh, uh in a college setup you know in a making studio or something where, where people get to do a little carving and do a little printing and you know mix some colors and try it uh all in one afternoon oh, wow. and um you know it's yeah. that's cool well any other uh thoughts or uh i'll put well, it one uh, oh, go for it oh i was going to say you know that the craft on this, you know, because I, I collect traditional Japanese wood blocks and mm -hmm. the craft element of that is crazy. I mean, all of those people went through, every one of them went through a five to seven year 
apprenticeship before they were even allowed to do anything on their own. And, you know, it's the craft is where you develop intentionality with your art. You know, there's a lot of people, if they don't have the craft, the outcome of a, the creative process is sort of random and you go, well, I did this and wow, I really like that result. But the ability to have something in your head and be able to make something that looks like that, that really requires a lot of craft, really. Your craft is crazy good. Mm. <laughs> and I, I, I'm on to a, do you know the uh, print designer Kunisada? Do you know? Absolutely. Yeah. So, um, and I have, it turns out a, a friend of mine, um, we were in college together. We were, we, we lived in the same dorm. We didn't know each other. Um, Izzy Goldman is a uh, dealer in, out of London. Maybe you've heard of him. And uh, um, uh, so Izzy sold me a Kunisada drawing. You know, they, they, oh. they, they did the drawings and then they pasted them to the box. So there are a lot of prints. And he was the most prolific of all. At any rate, so I, I had this drawing and, and um, the, the assumption, I showed it to um, Sarah Thompson at the, at the Museum of Fine Arts, actually. And she said, well, I recognize the print series. It probably was an image that never got made into a print. But I put it on Facebook. I actually uh, put it up on Facebook. I found it in, in, in actually Vincent Van Gogh had a print from the same series. It was an 1830 series. And at any rate, and um, I put these two things up on Facebook, and I get this I get this message in my exactly in my spam folder, and it, it was titled Cooney saw a drawing, and uh, it turns out it's actually somebody who had bought. Uh, one of my prints and he was, lived in the Boston area and he said I have your print <laughs> so it turns out my friend Taylor who's quite a collector of Kunisada prints owns a print that is almost like the draw my drawing it's the same image you can see the same oh wow image. so we've had the two of them side by side and we realized well there was another drawing there was another drawing that made his print so what, what the reason I'm telling this story is by that we can see there's subtle differences in proportion to parts of the drawing. There's some parts of the drawing which are almost identical to the print. And there are other major proportions and stuff which are definitely different. So what we realize is Kunisada would have been able to sit down and with this brush draw an almost identical drawing. That's what he would have had to have done. And the, the craft and the, <laughs> both the craft of, the, of that art is just. Well, it's really, you know, you're really lucky to actually have one of those drawings because those drawings got destroyed when they made the prints. Yeah. You know, yeah, no, yeah, so it's, because it's, they glue them to the blocks and then carve through. Yeah. So when you have those Hanshita, the, the master right. key block drawings, you know, if it, right. you're really actually lucky to have some that survived. <laughs> oh, and, and 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 you know, to to, to enjoy the, the you know the quality of the brushwork, it's just um, crazy. It, 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 and you know, the prints, of course, involved uh, you know his brushwork, and then um, you know assistants or you know students or helpers, and he had a lot. He had he had a lot of people working in the studios, and they would do all the patterns, and they would fill in maybe different parts and uh, but here you know it's his hand and you, you just can't believe the level I feel of of uh, of, um, of of artistry and 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 the way I think of it is on the end of his brush that that beautiful brush making those just so controlled lines there's both there's both craft mostly craft but a little art you know the way he laid it in each each time. Each unique what kills me is the fact that, you know, as you were talking about the, um, you know, when you were showing your prints and where you had done various col various colorations from your blocks, you can really see how important the print making as or the, the printing aspect right. is to these things. Right. And right. the carvers and printers on all those classic ones are basically anonymous. The people we know are the people who did the designs. We don't even know the names of the other guys. Well, if if we could read the older Japanese and stuff, a lot of times they do identify the 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 um, uh, 
the the printers and the carvers and uh, or you know this this is uh, to some extent my understanding. I mean Sarah Thompson at the MFA, had, you know she she did a really neat uh, exhibit of Kunisada Kuniyoshi a couple of years ago, and uh, for instance she showed this one print and um, a little write up beside the print said this was the print that made the career of and it was this certain carver this young carver carved this amazing hair well. Western, we would, we're not that interested in you know, the carving. But in Japan, in general, there's more interest and more value put on craftsmanship, actually, in some ways. We're more of a culture that emphasizes originality and invention, and we're not so interested in doing the same damn thing over and over again to our detriment. And in Japan, they, they're really into doing the same thing and get, learning it well maybe to their detriment at any rate. Um, so uh, that's true to an extent, but I'm not sure in the day, I, I'm not sure how true that was. I, I, I think actually the, the, the printing and the carving were, were maybe quite, uh, may, maybe often appreciated uh, quite a bit. Uh, my friend Dave Bull has helped, helped me to understand that they, they really, um, the prints at any rate, they kind of collected them as objects, almost as craft objects. And I, I, obviously the art was important, uh, but also the craftsmanship, you know, the way they were printed, they, they would have been more tuned into that, uh, likely. I mean, no one really knows. I, I was meeting one time, just to, to tell you stories, with actually the guy who really wrote the first book on Kunisada, and he's a significant dealer, Sebastian Izzard, has a wonderful gallery in, in New York, just down from the Met. And it was, it was I think, maybe the second time we, we got together, I met with him and, and, um, and he was telling me about the story of Kunisada and all. And then at one point he said, well, you know, the, the thing of it is, is Japan in the day, back in that, in that time, they had a 10 day week. It wasn't a seven day week. They had a 10 day the calendar. Week. And he said, most of these prints have about nine or 10 colors. So I think what they did was they printed one color each day. And I sat there, you know, he's the expert, older man. He, written lots of books and stuff and I said Sebastian you're wrong <laughs> I knew he was wrong because in nine days the prints would have molded I said there's no way they did it that way they had one guy print the you know one color and then right after it the next color they would have wanted to get those prints done in two or three days because in four or five days especially in Japan it's true for me when I'm printing here I can't go 10 days the papers will mold and they, they would have knocked them out in, in likely two or three days with a whole team. Anyway, you know, it's just a little detail. But uh, my point in saying this, we really don't know. And we just have the prints as, as, as the object to be able, you know, just to imagine. That's one of the beauties of art is it's, it becomes this paper trail of the story of the art and the craft. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Any other thoughts or... Uh, before we go have our, uh, uh, Kate's dinner is probably just about ready to eat now. <laughs> Big presentation, I learned a lot. Thanks so much. Oh, you're welcome. Yeah, thank you, Matt. Yeah. Thank you, I, I enjoyed watching the process. Oh, yeah. good. Should we, should thank we, you, Matt. Close it? Yeah, so, uh, hey, guys, thank you all so much for joining us, Ben and Matt, I, it was a, a very interesting presentation as well as just discussion overall. I feel like I've learned more and and I'm I'm excited for a, one of those classes. Um, if yeah. it does happen in January, I'll be there. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> um, oh, I'd be interested if I can, you know. Hopefully, we yeah. can uh, be in person. But oh, all right, I'll try. I'll try to put you on the list. Okay, right, and I'll send you the info. Yeah, when okay. I get to it. yeah. Yeah, I've already been harassing you via email on that. Oh, you have? Oh, yes. oh, oh, yeah, you have. Oh, cool, George. All right. So now I can connect. Um, yeah, that's yeah. me. The one who keeps popping oh, up yeah, and asking is you. That, you know, like today, I was deep in print, you know, uh, packaging and shipping and all. So we've got quite a bit of print ordering because of Christmas time. Yeah. Uh, but I'm going to try, I'll try to I'll try to get it, you know, listed. I think it's the weekend of the January 18th or 19th. I've got it on the, I just haven't, you know, uh, sort of pulled the trigger on uh, uh, formally announcing it. I don't think, although you might take a look at the website. It's under the teaching section. I, 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 I think it may be listed as a tentative and, 
And, uh, you know, I've got a list coming and I'll be sending it out. And then basically you, you mail in a deposit check and then, and then, then I'm committed. <laughs> We're going to do a class. So. Awesome. Well, um, what I could say though, is thank you all for joining the Hanover Adventure Tours Adventure Talk series. Um, this is one of many. Um, we will have another one next Thursday, uh, same time, six o'clock, uh, PM. And, uh, it's actually going to be about the Appalachian Trail and just the history Who's giving the talk? it's actually Odie so he was in the talk itself he um he's a very well-known individual on the trail and he will tell us the history he also creates the hiker yearbook which is kind of capturing those memories um throughout the trail so very interesting talk I'm really excited for it as well uh, and we'll have so many more every Thursday. So wait, so that same time next week. Yeah, cool. yeah. And uh, the next Thursday after that, the same thing. We're going to be doing something with the Upper Valley Trails Alliance. So lots going on, and I, I feel like this talk was absolutely amazing. It was uh, a little different from thinking, oh, it's an adventure talk series. This was an adventure, honestly. And um, yeah, like thank you all. That's kind of thank you. Yeah. Thank okay. You so much. Thank you. Oh. Yep. Bye all. Thank you all. Bye now. Thanks everybody. Bye.